A lot of interest over the last several years in some of the clean election laws um, in a few states, and um, which um, uh, do prohibit or do restrict um, private money um, in place of it. experiences so far in the states that have actually adopted it. Um, there, clean money is in a system for effect for legislative elections in uh, Arizona and Maine. And for the 2008 election, for the first time, they were in effect in Connecticut. Uh, they do seem to uh, help candidates make a decision to run. Uh, it is there. They, by providing money up front, they bring people into politics who uh, might not otherwise be there. I'm not certain that they do so in a way that's different, fundamentally different than other ways of getting money to candidates, but they do have that effect. Uh, in the two states where they, they've existed the longest, um, many candidates have pledged to the system have used it. They're happy with it. Uh, they're, is an increase in independent spending in both states. Uh, this has not driven candidates away from the system. <coughs> so that what I talked about in my, my theorized that eventually, inevitably, it would lead people away, um, that hasn't been the experience so far. Uh, we are doing a nature study in the state of Connecticut, leading a team of scholars from several number of different universities uh, in Connecticut, where we, we have gathered baseline data for the year 2006, uh, and we're studying 2008. Uh, so if you invite me back in a couple of years, I'll give you a much more detailed answer. Uh, but in Connecticut, it's rather astonishing. About three quarters of the candidates decided to use the system the first year it was in effect, and that's an extraordinarily high number. Uh, my remarks were saying that I prefer an ideal type of matching fund system that I could devise if I could be the sole legislator to a, to a clean election system. Of course, that's not the way laws are made. Uh, and, and so I wouldn't necessarily argue that any for, anything that has this label will automatically have effects that are better than that label. They'll, they'll each of them have some positives and some side effects that are problematic. Uh, the, uh, <coughs> I mean, we have, uh, we're somewhat agnostic on the level of, of what is the appropriate level of public financing. We've supported matching systems. We've supported uh, the so-called clean money systems. Uh, from our perspective, the more public financing into the system, the merrier. Uh, but I would agree and just underscore the point uh, that uh, Professor Malcolm made before, which is the limits really are an issue um, on the expenditure side. Uh, for example, in the uh, bills that are before the legislature, uh, two of them have $12 million spending limits for a uh, candidate running for governor, and one has $7.5 million running for, uh, for governor. Uh, can, I mean, you know, you have to go back in time to think of a gubernatorial candidate that won't spending that much money. And if you have the limits too low, you are creating disincentives for people to participate because they're afraid they'll lose. Um, and combined with limits that are so high, that's a devastating one-two punch on the uh, on the disincentive side. So uh, I think the, the spending limits are an issue, definitely an issue that I have to be taking a look at anytime you devise a system. Uh, on the issue of clean money uh, stuff in New York, I mean, we have advocated the more the merrier uh, when it comes to public financing. Um, and but we have raised this issue, particularly in the area of limits. Uh, so you, again, you don't, for actually in the bills, they talk about a cap on $350,000 for a uh, Senate the group and a, a Senate general and $150,000 in an assembly general. Uh, the contested assembly races now are three, four, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000. And so you, you don't want people to do, I mean, the issue is raised called political suicide. I mean, that's something that's going to run through somebody's minds if the limit is, the limit, limits are too low. May I, may I oh, sure. back on this? Um, uh, the spending limits, I, I just did a long, long study of the presidential system, and it, I finally came to the conclusion 
that spending limits can be described be described in one of three ways. They're either going to be too low for the candidate's comfort and they'll opt out, or they'll be so high that they don't matter, or else you're lucky and you hit the sweet spot where they restrain behavior. Yeah. Uh, but political conditions change, and none of us are smart enough to know what the lucky spot is. Yeah. So to, to my point of view, if what you're saying is, I would like something back in exchange for giving public money, I just think that's the wrong place to go. I think the place to go is to say, we'll give you public money, and in return, I won't take a contribution of more than a certain amount. Uh, and I think that ends up um, uh, being more of a lure for candidates to say, and if the candidates aren't in, it doesn't do, uh, the system isn't doing any good anyway. Uh, and in fact, it's encouraging what I think we would all like to see, now, which is more from this picture. On the clean election side, if you go that way, uh, again, the, what the Durbanville approach is, 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 has turned the flat grant into, in essence, a floor. Uh, it's a high floor, but it still says if you raise $100 contributions, you can keep going. Uh, so it's an alternative to worrying about where the limit should be. Are they, are they just a, <clears throat> sure. The, uh, the limits issue comes up, of course, because there's the fiscal side of the whole thing. And advocates, particularly legislators who want to advance public financing bills, want to keep the cost low. Uh, and so, you know, some of the, you know, so when you play the numbers out, the numbers are lower if the expenditure limits are lower. Mm -hmm. uh, you only have to limit the amount of public money that a person gets. Well, I'm, I'm not saying that you're wrong. I'm just saying that what's going on in their heads. Yeah, they're wrong. By the way, I would, uh, but I'm just, that is what that is what you we have run up against when you raise it. When I raise the issue of the limits being too low because you create disincentives, the pushback is well, if we raise limits or even have no limits. Again, you can limit the amount of public finance, and that would be a reasonable response. But that has been the driving reason as to why the limits are where they are. It's not that they pick low because they think good low is necessarily good. They're picking low because they're concerned about it. They're be defending it on the floor <coughs> at $100, $200 million public expenditure. It's in, in the federal bills, the new ones, what they're doing is they're saying no candidate may get more than X federal dollars. Well, there, really is, there are provisions in that, some in the bills, but they yeah. still have the spending uh, limit. I'm sorry. Are there any other questions? Are there questions? Bob? Uh, first, a quick comment and then a question. Oh. Bob Warrior from the Rockefeller Institute. Uh, Michael, on your point about the sweet spot, I, I would have the observation that if it becomes necessary to adjust the sweet spot, which of course it would over time, at any given time, Changing it will advantage one party more than the other, most likely, and so at any given time, it's going to be difficult to get the other party to agree to changing it. Therefore, it will almost never get changed. And even if you could hit it in the first instance, uh, probably uh, before too long, you would be out of that sweet spot. I, I would go further than that. Even in, in a world of perfectly good willed people, which you know, people are run for office want to win, but let's assume perfectly beneficent people. Who could possibly have predicted two years out from either of the last two campaigns what the campaign would look like? None of us are smart enough, even if we mean the best. So the sweet spot is simply a luck. If you hit it, it's luck. My question uh, relates to what you said about uh, Minnesota and the way that they attract a lot more people into uh, the contribution system with their tax credit, which, if I understood you correctly, you said it was uh, $50. What, what's the, maybe what's it? I'm sorry, the, you the, tell the, rebate about, amount, the rebate amount is $50, yes. Yeah. That's in the form of a tax credit, I assume, or? No, it's not a credit, it's a, but it's similar to a credit. Okay. What is a, that, can you tell us more about uh, how much that costs the state, and uh, maybe reflect on whether, if New York were to do that, what it would look like, and how it would work and so on? Well, you, you have to model it with, I mean, some assumptions about how many people would participate, right? Um, but if, what is the voting age population? Of the yes. 11 million, so 3% would be 300,000 people, right? Yeah. 300,000 people times $50 is what it would cost. Um, so, do you want to give an ask me, please? Uh, you're talking about one and a half. 
15 million. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and the way, the reason it's a rebate rather than a tax credit uh, is that people can get it back within a month, which okay. is very, which is important for both people. Nathan from the uh, Institute. Uh, the trouble with this uh, event today is uh, uh, having speakers who know so much, my goodness. <laughs> this is terrific. Uh, one in its case, and thank you both. Uh, what I'm hearing is a federalism story, and uh, I'd like to ask you the question, Michael, uh, to start anyway. That uh, And it's wonderful that you have uh, expanded CFI to do these uh, state studies, and uh, Blair's uh, story uh, helps us understand uh, that uh, good subject even better. So now, what I'm hearing is, uh, at the national level, there's something to be cheered about. At the state level, it's worse. Uh, maybe I'm just uh, in New York too long. But what I'd like to hear from you, Michael, a little bit, and Blair too, is how do you do something about it? How do you uh, uh, get uh, the public, the media, the uh, gurus to uh, uh, take the kind of steps that are, uh, in your expert views and in Blair's too, uh, the kinds of things that would uh, move down the federalism chain? Uh, I think you're right that it's a, there's a large federalism <laughs> where there's a diversity of approach story. Uh, um, I, I wouldn't, I don't think the state picture is uniformly like New York's. New York has got the second lowest level of small donor participation in the country. It also has, as Blair said, the highest contribution limit of any of the states with contribution limits. Uh, Massachusetts, 19% of the money comes from people who give them um, 100 or less. Uh, um, Rhode Island, 20%, or uh, let's get somewhere outside of uh, New England. Uh, the, states, the, the states vary. And one of the projects we're doing, Dick, because uh, I don't know the answer to this, but one is I can tell you what, how public policy might help. The uh, question is what else might help besides uh, besides public policy. And one thing we know uh, is for communica communications policy matters. Uh, do no harm, let make sure that the internet can continue doing what it's doing with, the, with an open architecture. But beyond that, um, we are going in and we're identifying states with high participation rates, candidates who had high participation rates, but we're putting together a successful practices guide and we haven't done it yet. Uh, but we're gonna go in and ask, uh, what do you do that makes it successful? Uh, and that, by disseminating the knowledge, uh, we do know that only incumbents typically afford fundraising consultants or any professional consultants at the state level. Uh, we do know that that just separate putting out the knowledge will help the non-incumbents. But uh, we'll, we, we do think that there, candidate campaigns are intermittent uh, uh, entities. They come into being, they disappear. What do you think building up the knowledge base uh, will help? Just to add uh, quickly, in terms of New York, um, while I gave you the quotes, again, I did give them with the caveat. Um, but I, th I think there actually is some momentum which may end up creating something that could act as a, as a laboratory for future work. Uh, the Attorney General's investigation as the Comptroller's Office has made, in my opinion anyway, almost nearly impossible where the current comptroller to raise money the old-fashioned way from Wall Street. Uh, and uh, I think that there's a real debate that if you want to have an independent fiscal watchdog in the state of New York, independent of the government, uh, you've got to figure out some way to pay for that person to do it in New York. Nobody knows who the comptroller is. They don't even know why there's a P in the word. Um, so, you know, how are you going to raise money? Now, there, you may be able to do that with some sort of innovative, grassroots approach where you come up with the unbelievable candidate who happens to want to be the state comptroller, unlikely, uh, or they, they really they are discussing public financing for the comptroller. This guy, money's got to come from somewhere, and you want a state fiscal watchdog, why not have the taxpayers pay for it? I have some 
And so philosophically, I think I, I agree with the idea of the comptroller going first. There's a unique, the comptroller is a unique political animal in New York. You, the Constitution creates the comptroller to be a separate person. There's a reason for that. You don't want him relying on the state party for money. You want that person to be almost judicial in how he or she administers the state books. Obviously, we've had some problems with our judges in the area. The comptroller was raised. So the comptroller was in the last few decades. Um, but nevertheless, I'm concerned about how they're going to do it. And the concern is what I talked about before. The sky-high limits, if they leave them in place, distort it, even if they do create a public financing system for this particular comptroller. I'm not exactly sure how they're going to deal with that. When I talk to them, they don't talk about changes to Article 14. They talk about phasing in a public financing system starting with the comptroller. And you know, if you do it wrong, the experiment will fail. If you do it right, you have a chance of saying, well, we've learned from these experiences. Maybe we don't want to have limits. Maybe we want to design it more with a rebate, which is a Minnesota thing I've always thought was a very interesting way of putting together a public financing system. Um, and you can learn some stuff for it, but if you, if you just graft on top of the same lousy old system a public financing thing for control, I'm not sure we're going to learn much other than that the public doesn't like it. So, I think there's a unique opportunity in New York, given the comptroller situation and this kind of uh, convergence of rhetorical positions by our legislative political leaders, or something I think there's a, the best chance that something will happen ever. Um, whether or not it happens, whether or not they do it right, of course, we'll see in the next couple of weeks. Good. I have another question. Um, Michael, I was raised by uh, the point that you just uh, suggested about the fact that candidate committees are pretty um, you know, come and go, or at least most of them come and go. Some of them come and stay for a long time, and stay in the office. But um, if you, if your goal really is to raise a lot of small, uh, is to engage a lot of small contributors, then it would seem that. Uh, you may also want to do something with respect to parties and uh, interest groups and create incentives for them. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering if you know first if there are places where you, whether you know much about the, uh, uh, the contributor base of, uh, of some state parties and whether they've actually, some, some of those parties have actually um, increased substantially their reliance on small contributors what factors might have been behind that, and, um, and, or, and whether that's actually part of your uh, uh, research. Um, we have not yet done the analysis of state parties. Okay. Uh, the, the data are spottier than for candidates. Uh, for, for, for federal parties, not to ask it, but I'll get to you. Okay. Um, I, Nearly half of the money is coming from people who aggregate to 200 or less. Uh, about a third of the congressional committees and half of the national committees. Uh, which tells you that sort of high visibility and ongoing organization are important to this. And one of the things the parties are doing, which is very interesting, uh, is that they are, if they give a candidate help, they're saying in return we get your donor list. Uh, so so subsidy helping candidates with small donors would in turn help the parties would be reciprocal. We have advocated, or I've advocated something of, with, again, with a little twist to that, uh, for several years, which is uh, the parties should be allowed to get around the fiction of spending unlimited amounts of independent spending. I mean, that seems strange to me for a party to claim independence from its presidential candidate. <laughs> On the other hand, I, I like party spending. Uh, but I don't like the idea that individuals should be able to earmark very large contributions through the party to help candidates. So on the federal level, state level, it's different. State, in many states, they just allow unlimited in-kind transfers. They allow all sorts of things. On the federal level, right now, they limit what parties can do to help, can, to give directly to candidates. So we've advocated, or I've advocated, um, unlimited help coordinated from money that you raise in small contributions, but not from your whole treasure. 
just to add a twist, I did have a slide on this, but as I was kind of going through it quickly, you may have missed it. Uh, one of the slides had uh, the legislative leaders for leadership committees, which, as I mentioned before, this nice little twist that we have in New York law, uh, received nearly as much from businesses and unions as the candidates from the 212 legislative positions combined. So who gives the, I mean, I mean, you've heard of a state party. If you're an average person walking down the sidewalk and say, hey, have you heard of the Republican Party? Yeah, I've heard about that. Have you heard of the Democratic Assembly Campaign Committee? I mean, who gives money to them? Uh, and they're allowed to transfer as much as they want to the candidates of their choice. They're allowed a $94,200 contribution per year. They're allowed unlimited money to their housekeeping account. And who does that benefit? It benefits the leadership in the legislature. So I would agree that small, donations to the parties, conference committees, I, would, I think that makes perfect sense. I think we should take a look at the housekeeping accounts as well, uh, because that's the way that uh, Mayor Bloomberg funneled $850,000 to the Senate Republican Campaign Committee. One individual sent $850,000 uh, to the Senate Republican Campaign, and that's how he can do it legally. Um, now, you know, again, he's an elected official. He's a weird kind of character. There's not that many billionaires running around the state. One fewer, as it turns out. Uh, and uh, you know, you can't necessarily draw policy decisions necessarily on the basis of one person. But I think a $94,200 limit with a CPI adjustment, by the way. So next time it will break the century mark. And and unlimited housekeeping account donations is over the top. Um, can I uh, go back to Dick's point about federalism? Uh, one of the interesting things about federalism is that states learn from each other. Um, and Illinois was, has been debating campaign finance for the last couple of months, and it looked around the country and looked around and said, where could we learn? What would be the best state for us to use for learning? And they decided New York. Yeah, so this last week, <laughs> last week they just passed a, a bill that the governor said they would sign, that for the first time in Illinois history, will impose contribution limits. Illinois was one of the very few states that allowed unlimited corporate and labor contributions as well as uh, pack and individual contributions. So they put on a $5,000 per year contribution limit from individuals to candidates. But if you're a political committee or a party, it's 90000 a year, which means 360000 to the governor. And if you're a party, it's unlimited in kind. So you see, they had only one place to look to learn those particular <laughs> rules. And, uh, and we, are, we are indeed the Empire State. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, Mark. Uh, Mark Marchand from the Institute. Uh, Blair, in your presentation, I think you referred to in New York, 0.2% yeah. currently contribute in some way, which seems shockingly low to me. As part of reform efforts, I'd be interested to hear if either of you have any ideas on how as part of this process you could increase that and like widen the base for more participation. Well, by the way, that was 0.2% for itemized, disclosed individual donations. And in New York, that's over on, over $99. So, uh, but it's tiny, no matter how you slice it. Um, yeah, I, I think the you know if you create financial incentives for people, for the candidates to reach out to small donors, and you create financial incentives for the small donors to want to contribute, you know, yeah, I think that is, works. You head, head down the path. So. The idea of matching fund falls into that category, even if it's the so-called green money, clean action, it's like 99 to 1, basically, for the match. Or 4 to 1, or 5 to 1, or 6 to 1, like New York City, you're, you're up to a certain amount. The uh, assembly bill is a 4 to 1 match up to $250. There's now an incentive for the candidate to go out and find them. And I think we can learn from Minnesota, where you're creating incentives for the, the public to want to donate, absent even the candidate asking for it. Obviously, that would normally be out of works. And I, I, I completely, and I think lower limits does that too, because the more you can move from the gigantic donations category to more reasonable lower donations, candidates and the parties are going to be looking to more donors. And if you create financial incentives for them to do that and for the individuals to participate, I think that those would all be very helpful. All right. First, for the sake of the record, if anybody reads it, what is reading a transcript right now uh, in the reading phase. 
uh, Blair's 0.2% and my 0.5 are completely compatible with each other. <laughs> His is itemized, mine includes an estimate for un un itemized and the same. Either way, they're incredibly low uh, nationally compared to other states. Second, we know from all sorts of things about internet retailing that the, lo the long tail is a reality. It really makes, really works. When you get down that tail, there really are many, many people out there, more than you could have imagined, who would seek out a particular pro product. The question is, how does the product or the candidate or the market or whatever it is get to that person? Do you have the incentive to look for that person? Um, one of the most exciting things to me about the Obama campaign, and not in a partisan way, this is a, uh, it was the extent to which his money, or how much of his money came in from mini bundlers. People, 70,000 people, who had little thermometers up, uh, trying to raise $200 total from friends, uh, giving to him. Their, their money, an awful lot of money, came from people who were solicited by other small donors. Uh, and that's the way you get more people, and as you persuade them that they matter. And they were persuaded that they matter when a person tells them that they matter and asks for the money, which you don't bother doing in this kind of structure. Right, and again, we had a slide on that. The number of individuals who made a small donation declined from 2000 to 2008. And it's not like they're spending less money running for office. It's just what's the incentive? If you can make, if you can make $94,000 calls or one $94,000 call, what do you make? And so, you know, the, the system is designed in New York for dialing for dollars to big donors. I mean, that's the way it's designed. And you'd be foolish at that to act any other way. Um, so uh, I think that's a bad system. Uh, I've looked at some of the research professors now in front. I completely agree with my anecdotal experiences. Big donors tend to be people that have commercial or business interests before the government. And that's the problem. So you want to move away from those folks, the people that are interested because they care about the policy or they're interested because they got motivated. And you, that's, the, that's typically, you're much more likely to see those people typically at the small donors. Okay. Well, we're just about up. So uh, unless there's any other questions out there. All right. Well, thank you very much.